This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, let's get it started. Um, thanks, everyone. This is the last episode this year, the Cornell Turf Show, our spring series, at least, uh, episode 19. Uh, you've been with us for 10 weeks, uh, and this is our, our last sports episode. Our guest today, Dr. Chase Straw from Texas A&M. Uh, you, uh, if you've been a loyal listener or watcher, you'll remember Chase from past seasons. Uh, we're going to have a good sports conversation from everything everything from precision turf management on sports fields down to the community sports field level. Uh, we'll try and cover a bunch of a bunch of topics in the fastest 30 minutes in turf. Um, so as always, Frank, I'll, I'll let you get it started with a little weather recap. And Yeah, yeah, I got a, I got a good thoughts. setup today. Chase, you're doing some really fascinating work that one of the great joys of prepping for these things is finding out what my colleagues are doing. So it was great fun. Uh, reading the work you have in there recently. So uh, big shout out, uh, our last uh, show of our third season. And, and you know, as, as Carl said, Chase has been with us a, a couple of times, all of us that like speaking into the ether, uh, you know, doing this show. Um, always appreciate Sports Turf managers taking a lot of pride in their work. This is a, uh, a Sports Turf manager uh, doing a really cool logo in the outfield. I, I think... You know, I, I have always been like, you know, a lot, a lot of people get into this profession to, you know, be in the background and not draw attention. And I think there's a place for just going about your job. And one of the things I think a lot of us like about this work is, is a, a lot of it is that you don't have to worry about a lot of different things that maybe other jobs do. But at the same time, um, I think promoting the things we do in cool ways like this attracts people to the industry, uh, especially young people that want to try uh, using technology and doing different things. So a simple logo like this is also a way of re recruiting young people. And then, and then you got these two knuckleheads who think that they should be doing uh, sports turf work. I got a little bit more respect for the, for Adam Wainwright than I do for the knucklehead on the right. I don't think the guy on the right could cut a straight line if his life depended on it. So I don't think we're taking up uh, Gronkowski anytime soon uh, to pick up lawn mowing, but I got to tell you, Chase, uh, one more funny thing, and we'll set up Carl for the stat of the day. Um, you guys take your high school football pretty seriously uh, down in Texas. And um, we're lucky we can get a $2 million uh, bond for uh, a track and a field. And um, this, this thing in McKinney, Texas, made the New York Times about four or five years ago. It got built. It had a little bit of trouble. But I think it was fascinating um and we'll and carl this sets you up for youth for yeah United yeah States. so so frank you're showing slides there 63 million dollar high school football field facilities almost 70 million dollars uh and i think you know a lot of this comes back uh, when we talk about youth sports participation a lot of people listening will, will sort of know the the uh benefits from having youth participate in sports and there's a couple studies here that looked at um, cardio metabolic health profile. That's everything from weight and, and ability to, to sustain cardio activities. 12 years after they played uh, sports in middle school and high school, uh, they saw that, that folks who, who participated in organized youth sports maintained those benefits. Uh, you can also find uh, a youth benefits in mental health and, and lower depression if they play organized sports. Um, so that's really good. And there's a lot of reasons to get your kids into sports. Uh, but unfortunately, it's it's not equal access among all the the kids in in our uh, in, in even in our state, but across the country. Uh, so you can see here a little bar graph of household income and the percentage of uh, youth who, who participate uh, in those brackets. So if you're below the poverty level, only about forty percent of kids in households like that participate in youth sports. If you go to four times that. Uh, income level that increases to almost eighty percent, right? So we we don't have even participation uh, among income levels in, with kids, and and that's really connected to sort of the uh, access to to uh, uh, public areas, uh, green spaces, baseball fields. You you see here, and another study said that investing in those local facilities can improve participation uh, of communities in need. So it's it's certainly something I think we all kind of know about, but it really places the importance on uh, public access green spaces. I have problems with with finding basketball courts for our for our basketball team, Special Olympics basketball. So I can't imagine with uh, with organized uh, football teams, baseball, young kids 
trying to get around and find places for those kids to to uh, play sports. Yeah, you know, Carl, I, I tell you, there's a couple of things, and we're going to actually get right at this because Chase has played around in this area, particularly the disparity sometimes uh, that gets called out in in his in that recent paper we're going to talk about. But but the data is a place to start. And even if you're just managing sports field, you say, oh, you know, I just cut the grass or I do this or do that, you know, justifying and, and making sure we're meeting the needs of the, uh, the participants is our job. But at the same time, we can be advocates uh, for these things. And a lot of times sports field managers can be those kind of people that facilitate these conversations because a lot of times they get pretty heated, I would imagine. And Chase, we'll get to talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about we're going to get to the heat. We're going to get some heat up here uh, in the Northeast, but we'll start out with the moisture for sports field managers. A lot of, a lot of seasons are wrapping up. Spring seasons are wrapping up. Uh, a lot of people are looking at soil management programs uh, for non sand based systems, uh, even for sand based systems that might get rolled and, and beat up a little bit. Um, you can see over the last month, uh, there's a quite a bit of dry area throughout the Northeast. You've got some really hard gradients from Pennsylvania border South, a lot of above hundred percent normal precipitation. And then as soon as you get above the Pennsylvania line and you get into new England and Northern new England, except for the far reaches of Northern new England and New Hampshire, Vermont and upstate New York, you're pretty dry. So the soils actually will be a, a little bit on the dry day up to this point in the last month are a little bit uh, on the dry side. So that makes them good for working. Now, last week, uh, total precipitation was about a half to an inch, depending on where you were. And now that evapotranspiration, if you look at this, you can see water loss, you know, the sun pulling the water out of the earth uh, is driving up into the one to 1.25 levels in some places. Now along the coast, metropolitan New York area, they're not losing as much water uh, and a little bit of rainfall um, won't, I mean, they won't be getting, uh, they'll be getting a little bit of rainfall this weekend that should help with that. So what are we expecting? Uh, where, where, what did we just get in the last few days when we look at precip minus uh, evapotranspiration? Again, uh, some dry areas throughout New England and Northern New York, uh, some a little wetter areas in Delmarva. But looking forward, it's again, looking like it's a balance. It's not going to be too wet. It's not going to be too dry. So from managing soils, uh, this could be a good time uh, to get those soils cultivated if you want to do anything, some top dressing, and take advantage of a couple of weeks uh, with some good weather before the real uh, persistent heat com starts coming. Now, soil temperatures are really well into the 50s and 60s, so there shouldn't be any problem getting grass seed to grow now uh, in these areas. So it's good timing in a lot of ways to start working the soil on some of these sports fields. Now, to air temperature, we are still on the roller coaster. We can see the up and down. We're not going down as much now. We're not getting down as cool uh, as we've been. Now, we're going to see uh, a big shift to this because we're going to go up the other way. Uh, right now, last week, we were about 10 to 12 degrees uh, above normal, uh, out, you know, as certainly as you get into northern New England and growing degree days, that, that change in heat where it was warmer up north and cooler down south last week has a real uh, uh, neutralizing effect on the growing season. It's helped the north catch up and it's kept the south at normal, but right around, we're about a week of normal now, one side or the other, we're about a week behind or a week ahead uh, of normal conditions uh, for the middle of, Mar middle of May. And it looks like the news coming out is that we're going to get stinking hot uh, this weekend. We're going to be into the 90s, creeping up into the upper 90s, which is nothing for our friend in the south there uh, to get into the 90s. But obviously the outlook and the growing degree days, look at the accumulation. Growing degree days, which we would have been happy a few weeks ago if we would have gotten 40 or 50 a week. In the New York metropolitan area, Philly area, you're going to be over 100 to 150 growing degree days for the week. So, you know, you're talking about 20 degrees uh, above average temperatures, uh, 20 degrees above 50. So 70 degree average temperatures during the day for the next several days to accumulate these things. Now, what that means, and this is the transition uh, 
Chase, into the conversation. What this means for us in the Northeast is we're going to actually experience our first what we call uh, heat stress, the, the combination of uh, air temperatures and humidity, particularly for persistent for more than eight hours. You can see it's starting to stretch up into the moderate level in the New York metropolitan area, Philly, up to Hudson Valley, out towards Boston. And, you know, Chase, as I bring you in, you know, one of the things you just did uh, is measure this, but really from a fascinating perspective, I thought. Um, this is an uh, article I got out of Sports Field Managers. It should be a research article. I don't, I don't know if you put this in the literature or not, but it certainly is worthy of it. It is uh, looking at player perceptions, right, and using that as a measure of thermal stress. And so you have a lot of measurements. You set up different uh, microclimates. You know, they played on different days, and during the games when they were playing, you would ask them questions about perceived surface temperature, perceived thermal comfort. And then you translated it to this COMFA scores, right? You, you asked them about these, these, how they perceived it. And this is where you're going to have, this is where I'm going to bring in, you're going to have to talk to us a little bit about this chart work here, right? Where you looked at energy budget um, and essentially, you know, this is very complicated, but here's how I read it. I read it as um, the players basically perceived stress in the very dangerous level on these synthetic surfaces. We would have liked the, all of those lines to be in the cream colored section, whereas they wound up in the dark brown section. So let's take a minute now, leave it here. Talk to us a little bit about doing this kind of work, working with athletes, and then getting this information. Because natural turf didn't fare so well either, which I think was surprising. So let's talk a little bit about this. Yeah, you know, and a, a lot of this research was new to me. And I, you all are pretty familiar with my work, Frank and Carl. A lot of the work that I do is interdisciplinary. So mm -hmm. some of these things are really hard to explain <laughs> even for me, right? Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm scratching my head. But yeah, you know, I was really surprised about the turf grass field being within that extremely danger zone. But I mean, that just goes to show you just ambient air temperature, how, how much of an influence that can have on, on people's perceived thermal stress. And, you know, the, the big takeaway from this is that artificial turf can decrease, or I'm sorry, natural turf grass can decrease uh, the player's perceived thermal stress by about 20% during the hottest times of the year. Um, so, so on artificial turf, 20, they perceive that field to be at least 20% hotter. And in my mind, that's going to affect a lot of things, right? Um, and it's going to affect a lot of things that we've actually measured as part of this study that we're actually going to write for a peer review publication, things like rate of dehydration. So we measured uh, a bunch of dehydration measurements throughout all of these games. Uh, performance, you all know that I like the GPS trackers. So we monitored their performance, their distance ran. Um, all of these different things tie together, and how does it influence them from a physiological standpoint, but also from the performance standpoint? Um, and that's it's the results are really interesting. We're writing that paper right now, and I really look forward to getting that published. Okay, so all right, no, <laughs> wait, you can't leave us there, brother. You gotta give us some teasers. So, what kinds so, of things are you finding? And I gotta say, it's so great that you're doing this, 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 it, you know, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work. Um, and, and things like who think a turf person involved in rate of dehydration, but by working with these people, you can get that. So you can give us a little preview to the paper. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the, the rate of dehydration was really surprising to me. So basically what we found out was there, there was not a significant difference in that rate of dehydration, but the trend was as you expected. So starting out pre-match, we measured their body weight. And then at the end of each quarter, we broke these games up into quarter. We did six simulated soccer matches um, and we had a non-hydration and a hydration group. So we had groups to compare. Uh, the non-hydration group was a group they, get, they were able to drink water between quarters and all that. The hydration group, they didn't drink anything the entire game. Uh, and, and so we measured at the end of each quarter, their body weight. So we could get that change in body weight. Uh, they did pee samples for urine specific yes. gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, I mean, we did it all. I, I didn't so do great. it. I had no <laughs> experience. Um, but the, but the trends are really interesting. So, so in a, in a nutshell, there, yeah. there was no difference. Um, but the trend was there. 
artificial turf, the, the rate was faster. It's just that that difference was, was not significant. Um, now, with that said, this was in September in Texas. August was a hotter month than, than September. This was just happened when we, we, when we did the study. Um, and it was only through six simulated matches. So if we were to do more, you know, maybe that separation starts to split. But, you know, the trend in performance and in the rate of dehydration is what you expected as well. As the game continued on, that separation started getting bigger and bigger. So if Worse on synthetic than natural grass. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, really interesting results to tie all of this together. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm focused on a little bitty portion of this study, but we're, we're piecing all the, all the different groups together and we're hoping, fingers crossed, you know how this is, Frank, try to get a publication in by the end of summer. We've been working on it for a year. That's right. <laughs> so, so, okay, a couple of things, right? Because now the setup, the setup for me, uh, the, you know, it's a perfect setup for this other work that you did. Because, you know, as you and I know, everybody who gets involved in turf extension work in any state is going to get, should I put a natural field in or a synthetic field in, right? And, and right. I would see that context of having that data, doing that interdisciplinary work, understanding things at a really high level um, becomes part of this work in putting communities together. Now, let me introduce this particular topic because you published this paper with a lot of other people <laughs> who are not turf people and wanted to look at what I can tell you can become one of the most contentious issues in New York. Never mind in Texas where they'll spend $70 million on a friggin' out. I mean, I, don't, I mean, I, I, and in Texas, they can bring guns to these meetings. So that's a, that's embarrassing, by the way. I didn't, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's crazy. I, I know. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to talk about this in a lighthearted way, but I'm sure there's a lot of people in Texas don't take this in a lighthearted way. So you put together this really nice uh, collection of information that tries to set up the way a community uh, might approach this, right? The way of bringing people together to use data like you're generating from the athlete's perspective. You know, you look at footwear like Sorokin and McNitt do on, okay, how do you help people pick footwear? And then what I loved is that, you know, you introduced this thing around, uh, you know, hey, this is a, a thing for the world. It's not just, you know, the United States. Sports is a way of actually bringing people together, giving access to other people. The United Nations has gotten involved. The sports development for peace. I thought this was, I spent a couple hours just looking into this stuff. I was so fascinated by it. But when I look at it, you know, I think about what they put in the UN and I look at the paper that you did here and when I look at these things that kids benefit from, right, having this athletic stuff like Carl showed in the data and you're testing, hey, what's the best surface for them to be on? It almost seems petty to try to argue synthetic or natural turf. Let's just give these kids a place to play. Um, how did this piece of work come about and how are you able to start to think about using it and facilitating it in your work? Chase is is really the question for me, and I'll just stop and we'll look at each other now. Um, how do you how do you take this work and start to put it into action as an extension specialist? And for our sports trivia managers listening to this thing, what are the takeaways for them with some of this information? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it all started. It's been a slow trickle for me, and we're building up to where we finally have this publication because, you know, in grad school, a lot of the work that I did was on community level fields. All the literature that I read, I just started to recognize it's all at the professional level. It's all at the collegiate level. You know, there's just not that information out there. And then as I go to all my research sites to do all my work, I'm talking to these guys and I'm hearing these conversations about what they're having and what they're having to deal with. In some situations, I mean, College Station's building a new uh, artificial turf baseball park. And, you know, the field manager, the director of grounds, he didn't even know about it. He was not based in that decision whatsoever. Uh. And, you know, you, you hear it all the time. It happened to Kentucky, you know, where I'm from, uh, when they converted from grass to artificial turf. Uh, they didn't let the sports field manager know that they were converting. It just happened. Um, and, you know, that's just us, our side, the turf side. You know, what other opinions, especially at that community level, are not getting considered. Like what other, what other uh, 
factors aren't being put to play. And, you know, we always think about these acute injuries, you know, heat is obviously a big thing with artificial turf and grass, but there's, there's the accessibility, um, you know, cause I, I would assume that Joe Schmo can't walk on that $74 million football field. <laughs> That's exactly that right, brother. Yeah. That's exactly you know? right. So if the community is investing that much money into their football field, you know, what about the other fields, the middle schools and the elementary schools and all of that? There's got to be a trade-off, right? Yeah. And there's no data out there. There's no, there's no information on how these decisions get made. There's no data or tool, which is something that we're- Well, okay, wait, okay. I'll give you some data. You want some data? One town says they got a $40 million field. I want a $60 million field. Or in our case, they'll say, well, this really nice lacrosse school in Westchester County, New York is synthetic. It's a badge of honor to have a synthetic turf field. And again, you know, I look at it like, how much use are you getting? Like I could argue for a synthetic field. I could argue against a synthetic field, depending on the context. When you look at these things, Chase, and you peel back and the grounds manager isn't involved, who is making these decisions? Business managers? The people with the money, right? It's the money, it's the money people, right? Um, but, but, you know, in today's world and, you know, maybe not so much in Texas as New, as New York, but the, the whole environmental factor too, right? The heat, you build these things next to buildings, the artificial turf, there, you know, there's research that how it can influence all of that, you know, uh, the green spaces, the car, the whole issue with carbon now and urban yeah, space. Yeah. I mean, there, it, it's all tied together, right? And to me, to just make the call because uh, the county over did it, so let's do it or because we can play a few more games on it, you know, they're really not putting full thought into that. And that's kind of where this whole, the whole paper came from. Well, and, you know, I, I, I started to piece together people at the University of Minnesota when I was there to, to do this. Cause the, and the nice thing about that is we're in a bigger city. We had uh, the National Sports Center. It's one of the biggest soccer complexes in the country is uh, north of Minneapolis. So we had basically hundreds of fields at our disposal that we could do research on with actual people. Um, and I left and came to Texas, and then I met a whole nother group of people that could do this stakeholder network stuff of tying people together. Where are their gaps in decision-making? Where's their, uh, who's not being considered? Uh, things like well, that. Well, okay, so there's where I'm gonna get you. Now, this is area that you, know, you and I as scientists don't venture into very often. It can be a contentious issue nowadays because we've politicized uh, diversity, equity, inclusion stuff. But it is absolutely clear as day, I can tell you, that as a white guy, I do a lot of listening. I, I, I try to listen, right? Because we've been talking too much. But one of the things I will say is when I go in there, there's not a lot of diversity making that decision either. And when they're thinking about spending all that money, it's not necessarily for the poor kids or it's not necessarily for the black and brown kids. And I can tell you from talking to architects in New York City who've worked for the city parks people, and they say they put a park in a black neighborhood and it's got basketball courts and no grass. They put a park in a white neighborhood and it's a lot of grass fields, right? Those sorts of things. And I don't think anybody intentionally does this. No, I don't think there's a person who actually thinks, oh, they're black, let's do this. Or they're white, let's do that. It's a cultural thing. How have you, got, in God's name, began to approach this uh, in a place like Texas? <laughs> I wrote a paper. <laughs> that, that's where we are now. So, you know, I was telling you uh, in an email that this past week, you know, we're going to start bringing stakeholders in, uh, in Minnesota and Texas. That's where we're starting. And we're going to bring in the park director people. We're going to bring in, hopefully, some people that make decisions at ISD, city council people. And we're going to figure out how they bring these people in to make decisions. You know, it's, I don't know. And it's probably going to vary, right? It's going to mm -hmm. vary based on whatever city or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to figure that out so that we can start figuring out better ways to bring in more people to get more of in, in, in a logical way, right? Like a lot of these people, they're on timelines. Everything's timeline now, right? You got to exactly get it right. done. You got to get it done. So how can we, how can we basically develop this tool that can help communities reach to those voices who are unheard and include them into that conversation in a logical manner 
to where their voice is actually con actually considered too, not just there to talk. You know, uh, th th this is um, th you know. So now you're into something, right? Where you know. What is the role of a sports field manager, right? As you just indicated so brilliantly, they're usually the last ones to know about things. How does the, you know, like our regular listener, Ben Palmer in the city of Weston, Massachusetts, how does someone who's working at a school district get more involved in the conversation? Because, you know, we're turf people. A lot of us get into this line of work because we don't necessarily want to be involved in these conversations. I don't think you find a ton of people, people in our turf field because we ride mowers and we work in fields and we tend to do those things. So even interacting with coaches and athletes can be tricky for us sometimes as a population. And I'm not disparaging that we can, it's just sometimes our personalities don't align with that work. Where does a sports field manager start, Chase, in trying to get this going before you know we get you figured out all these things? What's a couple of simple tips you'd give people listening for where to get started with this I, you know i think the the interdisciplinary research that it's becoming just so common now like mm -hmm. it's it's more the research that comes out of our industry now is more than just mowing high water use stuff. it better be you know uh because the people you know turf is just such a major part of society and people don't even realize it that's right and so uh, i would dig into these the literatures i mean in sportsman management magazine they come up with they're, they're starting to incorporate new research that's part and part of the editorial we're trying to get more research in there you know really dive into the literature the things that are going on across the country and, and just be aware of that and how people are obviously they talk most people talk to their colleagues and all that but the literature the data especially this interdisciplinary stuff that shows how turf impacts, turf grass and artificial turf impacts society, like know that stuff. Um, Cause it's gonna be important and it's gonna give you fuel. To, I don't wanna say fuel, but it's gonna give you, you know, a conversation point, a talking point with uh, maybe somebody that doesn't understand. And then with the tools and technologies, with the mapping and the data, all of that can be hard for people to do. I totally get it, but that's just another way you can use a quantifiable number, hard data, to either make a point or to, 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 you know, show something. Well, and let me, so, okay. So all that said, uh, we're getting close to wrapping up. I want to tie it back to the synthetic turf thing. It looks like if I was looking at your data correctly, it doesn't really matter what that surface temperature is. Even if the grass is a little cooler, those athletes at certain times are at danger, are in danger. And that's not what I think a lot of people think. I think they, most people think like you described with the hydration experiment, that the gap is much wider, right, than it actually is. Um, with that as a backdrop, you know, <laughs> super, you know, grounds managers can't necessarily say synthetic turf is 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 that bad, right? I mean, injecting yourself into that part of the conversation had to be surprising. Finding out that the athletes perceive it different, but it's still troublesome. Do you see sports field managers assertively going out and saying, "Hey"? I got data that says it's going to be a tricky day, even on the grass today. Do you think we got enough people around these kids at these school levels to take care of their health and well-being? Because you've identified it. Is somebody tending to it? They need to. Uh, and they're, the wet bulb globe temperature is what is typically considered. Uh, ambient temperature you don't want to use because the surface temperature is going to be so different. We show oh. that in the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they, they need to. And, you know, uh, one thing that I've learned from all this, too, is that and I, it's common sense. I just hadn't thought about it is that youth are more susceptible to the heat. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we did collegiate athletes. So basically adults, mm -hmm. um, you throw a 10 year old, eight year old, some of these younger kids out there in that heat, that danger zone is going to go way up, even on grass. Even on grass, yeah. And this is in September. That's another thing. And, you know, year-round artificial turf, that's not true, in, especially in Texas. There's months here. This month has been too hot for people. So, I mean, there's places that shut down because it's too hot, and it's not 24-7. It might be more durable, but it's not 24-7, and you do need to strongly consider that heat, the surface temperature. Chase, I think I could talk to you all day about this, especially bringing in these other disciplines. Carl and I talk about this all the time. 
I'm done with mowing height work. You know what I mean? I'm done with comparing one fertilizer to another, one grass type to another. There's a lot of people doing that work still. And it's imp I'm not disparaging it. It's important work. But I don't think it's going to advance this industry in a way it needs to be as, as much as you're doing. That's why I keep bugging you. Carl, get us out of here. Chase, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Chase. Again, uh, really insightful. Like Frank says, we could listen all day about this sort of thing. And, and this, you know, these recordings, if you guys are watching on, on YouTube or listening on a podcast, these are great things to, to pass on to yeah. maybe the people making decisions. And so they can read this, this sort of paper that really outlines a, a framework. And, and sounds like, Chase, you're going to try and uh, test out test out that framework and see how well it goes. I'm sure it will change. Over so he's time. guaranteed to be back for season four, Carl. That's right. That's right. Uh, thanks, everyone, our, our live audience all year long. Thank you guys for joining uh, people listed on the podcast or YouTube. Uh, you know, let us know how we did. W would you like to see different things? Are we idiots? Are we talking no, to you? Give, us some, give, give us some feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Call us names, whatever you want to do, but, but leave some feedback for us. Uh, thank you for, for being with us for season three of the Cornell Turf Show. We'll be back probably later in the season with a couple uh, odds and ends episodes. Pop -ups. Pop, -ups. pop up episodes, but until then, uh, take care, everybody. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.